Greetings! With the cost of energy going through the roof, I thought I'd get myself a radiator booster, but given the cost of them for what they are, I thought I'd build my own. In case you didn't know about them, radiator boosters provide fan assistance to conventional central heating radiators, so they're not just relying on convection currents to achieve airflow through the back. As you can see, even after burning a load out, I've still got quite an assortment of old fans which have been scavenged from various things. These ones are quite small, and fortunately, they're quite loud. Because the blades are so small, they're going to run very quickly to get any sort of meaningful airflow. Larger ones, such as this one, can get a much higher volume of airflow with a much lower volume of noise. I've got some big 24 volt UPS fans here. They don't actually need 24 volts and will run quite happily at 12. And in fact, will go right down to 5 volts. So as long as they fit under the radiator, they should be good. Unfortunately, they won't fit under the radiator in the living room, so I'll have to use something else. These Xbox 360 fans. I've got plenty of these. They'll do. So, how am I going to control them? A computer would give some flexibility, so I've got a teeny tiny little computer. An Arduino Nano. That'll do. Now an Arduino can't drive a motor directly as it'll require far too much current. They can only kick out about 40 milliamps per bin. It can easily drive a MOSFET though. I've got quite a few IRFZ 44s knocking about that'll do the job. An IRLZ 44 would be better as its gate voltage is designed for connecting to logic level stuff such as an Arduino. But I'm not pulling a lot of current through so hopefully this will do. And it'll save me actually buying some. For temperature sensing, I'm just going to use one of these bog standard 2N3904 transistors. That's it. Just the transistor. And here's why. Here we have the transistor in circuit. All it's got is the emitter connected to ground and the base and the collector tied together and fed via 20k of resistance to a 5 volt supply. The reason for the 20k will be apparent later. What you're seeing on the meter and on the scope is the voltage between the base and the emitter. But if I heat it up, even with a fingertip, you can see that, that voltage is starting to drop. And when I let it go, it goes back up again. If I heat it up with a soldering iron, you can see that it drops really quickly. The Arduino has input pins which can actually measure this. There are a few other components I need besides the sensing transistor and the MOSFET. I'm going to add some LEDs to show when the temperature is being detected as rising or falling and three variable resistors to control the turn on temperature, the full speed temperature and the maximum speed of the motor. Add a few current limiting resistors and some connectors and we're hopefully all set. If you want to save a few bob, you can hard code the values for these presets and do away with them. And if you're really tight, you can do away with the LEDs as well. I've already scavenged them from something else, so they're going in. The biggest cost really is the 12 volt power supply which ought to be something reputable and not some dangerous crap from eBay. I've got some CCTV power supplies that will do nicely, but I can also stick with the Xbox theme and repurpose an Xbox power supply, which has a 5 volt and a very juicy 12 volt output, in this case 14 amps. As you can see, I've designed this with the variable resistors wired with all three legs going to the Arduino. This is just to make it easier to assemble, as instead of providing supply and ground connections to each resistor, I can just configure the pins either side of the input as outputs, set one high and the other low. I might have to extend the middle pin with a jumper wire just to get it to reach, but that's no big deal. Here's the code, and it's in three parts. First of all, we've got some variables, most of which just assign names to the various pins just to make the code easier to read and alter, for example if you wanted to swap some pins around. After this we've got a setup routine. This runs once and is used to set the various pins as inputs or outputs and in the case of those outputs whether they're high or low. That's how those variable resistors get the supply at each end. Right at the end of the list you can see that the temperature sensor input is set as an input. Now for a lot of the analog inputs you can enable a built-in pull-up resistor. Remember the 20k resistor I was testing with earlier? That's why I chose it. Unfortunately that's not the case for pins A6 and A7. These have no output capability and therefore no pull-up capability because it uses the same circuitry. 
so I'm going to bodge this from the 5 volts presented by pin A5. I could have used the 5 volt pin, but I'd rather keep that separate in case I want to use that as a supply pin for the Arduino. The last section is the loop routine. This bit just keeps on running in a loop, hence the name. All the bits with double slashes at the start are just comments, which don't find their way into the Arduino, and are just there to make the code easier to understand. This is useful if someone needs to make alterations to the code at a later date and needs to work out, or remember, what the code does. So the first thing that gets read is the lower setpoint resistor. This will be read as 0 to 1023 for an input of between 0 and 5 volts. We don't need it to be that precise, especially as there could be some noise, so it gets divided by 10 and then restricted to between 1 and 100. Next, the temperature sensor gets read. This only has a narrow voltage range, so we're not going to divide it down, but we are going to reverse and offset it so that it fits better with the range from the setpoint presets. If you wanted more precision, we could boost the voltage with a VBE multiplier circuit, but we don't really need that here. The next bit I initially thought of for initial troubleshooting, but I decided it could stay in as we could plenty of spare pins. First of all, it turns off both LEDs, and then if the temperature is either higher or lower than it was a second ago, the rise or fall LED gets turned on. If there's no change, then the LEDs will both be off. If the LEDs keep flicking one way and the other when they shouldn't be, then there's possibly too much electrical noise in the sensing wire, and that might need addressing if it's having a noticeable effect on the fans. Finally, this bit copies the current temperature over the previous temperature, ready for the next cycle in about a second's time. So we've read the temperature and the lower set point. What next? Well, if the temperature is below the set point, we'll disable the fan motor. If it's above the set point, we'll turn it on. If it's at the set point, we won't change it. This dead zone should stop the motor flicking on and off rapidly when the temperature is hovering around the set point. If the dead zone needs widening because the motors are rapidly cutting in and out, then we can extend it by changing the dead zone value at the top of the code. Now we're into the home stretch. Is the motor disabled? If so, set the speed to zero and wait a second. If it's enabled, go through the final bit of code which sets the motor speed. First it's time to read the upper set point. We've already got the temperature at which the fans come on at their minimum allowed speed. This one is used to set the temperature at which the fans are running at their maximum allowed speed. Again, this is divided by 10, but this time, instead of being limited between 1 and 100, it's limited to between 1 plus the lower set point and 102. This ensures that no matter what daft settings you turn the presets to, the upper set point is always going to be higher than the lower one. Next we read the last of the presets, which acts as a speed limiter for the motor. We don't need a value of 0 to 1023 for this, so we'll just read it and divide by 100 to get a range of 0 to 10. Next, once again, we make sure that the maximum speed isn't lower than the minimum speed. Now we have a really useful command which takes the temperature relative to the lower and upper set points and outputs a corresponding motor speed relative to the minimum and top speeds. That speed now gets limited by the maximum speed read earlier, and the result is finally ready for driving the motor output pin. This uses pulse width modulation, so the higher the value, the higher the duty cycle. And this is where things aren't quite as straightforward as expected. The Arduino does have built-in PWM capability, but it's not very fast. If you use that, the motors whine loudly. You can't just filter it with a capacitor across the motor as it causes the capacitor to heat up, plus it throws power back towards the supply and actually drives up the supply voltage, or at least it does on the bench power supply I've been using. It may sound weird, but that's what it does. So to get around this, we can do our own high-speed PWM loop, running at around about 28 kilohertz, so it's too high for anyone to hear. To do this, we first check if the speed is zero. If it is, we just send the output low and wait a second. If it's a 10, we send it high and wait a second. That's given us our fully off and fully on states. For anything else, we'll run a short loop 28,000 times. Each time it runs, it sends the motor pin high, delays by three times the motor speed microseconds, so three to 27, then sends the motor pin low and delays by three times 10 minus the motor speed in microseconds, so 27 to three. In practice, it comes to around 28 kilohertz because all these commands actually do take a little bit of time to run inside the Arduino itself. Finally, once that loop is run, we'll toggle the Arduino's built-in LED, just so we can see that it's actually running in a loop. Each loop through, we'll turn the LED on or off. Here it is all assembled. Only a small piece of strip board is required. It's only got to hold the MOSFET, the LEDs and the connectors. Well, obviously, and the Arduino itself. The MOSFET's not being driven hard at all, so I've not fitted a heatsink to it. Let's see if it works on a bench power supply. So 
certainly seems to. If I heat it up on the soldering iron. It looks like I got it right first time, but in fact it's taken a few rewrites of the code to get it working properly. I only found out about the motor whine when I initially tried using the built-in PWM. That all had to be rewritten. Now that's with an Xbox fan. It also works with this two-wire fan. Although it does take quite a bit more before it'll actually get going. You can also see that if I lower the upper set point control, which needs to go that way, the fan will speed up. And if I adjust this control, that will adjust how low that maximum speed actually is. The 24 volt fans aren't best pleased about running with a low duty cycle. The solution for that would be to run them at a higher duty cycle that they'll behave at, but on a lower supply voltage, such as a 5 volt USB power supply, which in fact it can run all of them on. As long as I don't need to be able to run them actually at full speed. And the same goes for this 3 wire fan. It already uses pulse trains internally to drive its fan, and it's not best pleased if it's being fed by a pulse train as well. Now they may perform better if the IRLZ MOSFETs are used instead, as they may have a better turn on and turn off time than the IRFZs. The scope shows quite a distorted waveform. If you view that from the MOSFET side of the gate resistor, and I expect the MOSFET itself is causing that. Now if I fit some fans to a radiator, what sort of difference does it make? Well, let's dig out the thermal camera and find out. I've got three blocks of Xbox fans, so there's six fans in total, all sitting on the right hand side of this radiator. The left hand side of the radiator doesn't have any fans on it. The hot spot down at the bottom is the Arduino. I've got the temperature sensor clipped onto the bottom of the radiator with the clothes peg. Let's see what happens when I turn the radiator on. Interestingly, you can see that the radiator warms up in the top corner first because the right hand side in this case is where the water, the hot water comes into the radiator and obviously it's flowing up to the top first so perhaps you would mount the temperature sensor close to the top if you wanted it to react quicker or of course you could just set the threshold lower. 18 minutes in and it's finally started to recognize that something's going on with that transistor. It's got within the the range now where the Arduino is suddenly interested in what's going on is it's detecting a change there although it's it's not yet triggered the fans finally it's just on the cusp of turning on beaten here this is where that threshold setting would come into play where you'd want to adjust it to stop cycling in and out like this. Now about 10 minutes in and if I put my hand above the fans I can feel it's pushing warm air but it's not that warm. I mean I felt warmer air coming out the back of my PC to be honest. So if they're really that effective, what I should see here is the left hand part of the radiator I'd expect to be warmer than the right hand part because the right hand part is being fan cooled. So let's see the difference if I pan the camera across. Now 
Okay, that may be a bit higher up. Oh, there we go, yeah. So that's about 37 and a half in the middle of the radiator. And that is about... about the same. And the rest of the radiator, it does seem warmer at that end. So it's having some effect, but not really much of an effect. I don't think you'd feel much of a difference there. And in fact, certainly at the lower speeds, if you put your hand above the fan, the, the air there seems to be about the same temperature as if you put your hand above the radiator. So that's a change of tack for this video. The, the rest of this was going to be me making another one of these things uh, to build underneath the radiator. But having tested it, I don't think it's worth it. This should be filed away in the projects marked just because you can doesn't mean you should. It seems to make negligible difference to the um, to the temperature of the air leaving the top of the radiator, even if you do slow the fans down um, to the point where they're not quite so noticeable, it's still, there seems to be more warm air coming from the unfan cooled part of the radiator than the bit with the fans. It's certainly not worth, I mean at full tilt that thing was drawing 12 watts and it wasn't, it wasn't making the room any warmer. It certainly didn't seem to be making the radiator much cooler either. Certainly not the, the dramatic, you know, I was expecting quite a dramatic difference between the two halves of the radiator and we didn't get that. So you know, the circuit worked, it's just the idea didn't. So if you wanted to go ahead and buy one of those radiator boosters, I mean, I'm not stopping you, I'm not your dad, but I'd certainly recommend buying it from somewhere which has if you pardon the pun, a cooling off period. Because you want to test these things and find out for yourself whether they work for you. Whether the benefit for you, if you find any benefit at all, is worth the cost. If you're hell-bent on making your central heating radiators more efficient, I'd recommend going for the, uh, the insulation panels to go behind the radiators, because they do make a difference. I've seen on thermal camera for myself in my house because one of my walls in the extension is single skin and before I insulated the inside of that I had heat keeper panels on there and it made a big difference compared to when I didn't have the panel on. On thermal camera you could see that that chunk of wall was lit up like a Christmas tree where the radiator was. You could tell a mile off from where the radiator was. The heat keeper panels made a big difference on that. So if you're going to spend any money trying to make it really is more efficient, I'd recommend that ahead of the fans. These Arduinos are cheap enough to leave in whatever project you've created. I mean, you know, this is only a couple of quid. Uh, in this instance, I'm not going to keep it on there. I'm going to desolder that and I'll, I'll use the Arduino on something else or I'll just chuck it in a drawer. But it's not staying with this because, in my opinion, it's not worth it. Hope you found this useful or educational or economically useful, I suppose. Thanks very much for watching. I'll catch you soon. Bye.